Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mark Moss Show, where we talk about the decentralized revolution. Of course, we talk about the way the world is changing from a very centralized world into a decentralized world. Of course, we look at it through the lens of politics, finance, and technology. And it's always technology that changes the world. Technology has changed the way that we communicate, we organize, and so it changes the political structure, the economic structure, and so much more. And the big changing technology that we have right now that's changing the world is Bitcoin. Now, for some people, they think, oh, I get it, yeah, Bitcoin is sort of like this digital cash, digital money, kind of whatever. Okay, uh, sure. I mean, it's one way to think about it. Uh, but it is so much bigger. It's changing the world more than we know. It's sort of like, um, if you look back in history, you see a little piece of technology. And uh, like, for example, one of the biggest changing pieces of technology um, about 1,020 years ago was the stirrup. Now that seems ridiculous. Like, could you imagine like we've been riding horses for thousands of years, but we didn't have a stirrup. But when that stirrup was created, it changed the course of the world from a very decentralized world into a centralized world because it, it changed the way that you could administer power, the return on violence. Google it. I'm not going to give you that whole story. If you want, you can check it out. But um, so when you look at a new piece of technology like a stirrup, I mean, how come on, that's going to change the world. Uh, a technology like the printing press that's going to change the world. The internet, yes. Anyway, we're talking about the fight over Bitcoin, crypto, CBDCs. We're talking about the economy being forced into a recession to stop inflation. We're going to talk about how mainstream media is now jumping in to uh, take down Biden. And is he going to try to change the rules before that happens? And then we're going to talk about the battle over free speech, picking up steam right now, Elon Musk, Twitter, Tucker Carlson, and more. But let, right now, we're talking about the fight over Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and CBDCs. It's coming to a head. Of course, every time there's a new technology, the powers that be try to stop it. <laughs> they always try to change. They always try to stop technology because they don't want to. They don't want change. They want to maintain the status quo. That's why the church and state tried to stop the printing press. They didn't want people to get the Bibles out there. It's why the government now today is wanting to stop the internet. They don't want the people to have the information. It's why they're trying to stop cryptocurrencies. They don't want us to have our own form of money. I think overall, you could probably just say categorically, if you find yourself on the side of the government, you might be on the wrong side. But in regards to that, you know, there's a lot of news. There's been this fight. There's been this attack to cryptocurrencies, specifically cryptocurrencies, not so much with Bitcoin. I've been talking about this for well over a year, and we saw another big uh, Bitcoin, or I'm sorry, cryptocurrency exchange, Bittrex, um, has left the United States and filed for bankruptcy, and the government is suing them on top of that. So more uh, adversarial take against cryptocurrency from the government. Another big piece of news that um, could be helpful for you. So as you know, last year we talked about the collapse of Terra Luna. Then we talked about you know the, the domino effect that went on after that, which included uh, Terra Luna and then Celsius and then BlockFi all went down. And if you had money locked up in those platforms, it looks like a little bit of money might be coming out. As a matter of fact, BlockFi customers can now be repaid $300 million that was held in custodial accounts. I talked about this a year ago. If you had money on Celsius or BlockFi, you could have had it in a custodial account, meaning you were just st storing it there. If you were storing it there in a custodial account, you would probably get that money back. That's what I predicted, and that's exactly what it looks like is happening now. Custodial account meaning I just had it stored there. Now, if you were in one of their products, such as you were earning yield or you're getting a loan against it, that money's most likely gone, or you're not going to be getting all of it back. You're going to maybe, if you're lucky, get a few cents on the dollar back. But the custodial accounts, as I predicted, would be getting money back, and that's exactly what happened. $300 million was ordered to be returned by the judge. The court finds that all digital assets held by debtors in custodial omnibus wallets are indeed client property and not property of the bankruptcy estates. So good news if you're a BlockFi customer, and I believe Celsius has the same deal going. Now, in regards to the fight over cryptocurrency, it's pushing Bittrex into bankruptcy and out of the country. We see that the SEC is continuing to become more restrictive. Uh, Gary Gensler is, is leading the charge with this. And of course, we talked about in, in previous shows how they're now saying, look, Gary Gensler, you're taking the wrong stance. And there's even a call to get Gary Gensler removed. But either way, the SEC is, is, uh, is continuing its attack. And now the SEC is laying its cards on the table with an assertion that DeFi, decentralized finance, actually falls under their own security rules. 
As a matter of fact, it says that unless Congress legislates otherwise, U.S. oversight will hold most of the crypto world inside the SEC's jurisdiction as the agency moves to make its reach increasingly explicit. So unless Congress legislates otherwise, pretty interesting uh, choice of words there because I thought I lived in the United States. I thought I lived in the land of the free. The land of the free means that we're free to do everything unless there's a law that says we can't do something. You see, laws prevent us from doing things. They don't give us permission. So I thought that was pretty interesting there's how, how, how that choice of words went, unless Congress legislates otherwise. Now, there's been, a, like I said, a full court attack. We've also been seeing an attack on Bitcoin mining specifically. We've talked about this in Texas. The New York Times did a big hit piece on Bitcoin mining there in Texas. We saw um, in, in the state of New York, they're attacking Bitcoin mining. And so it's really coming under attack. We've seen the opposite, though, now here, where in Montana, they actually ratified legislation. They passed a bill that actually protects Bitcoin mining. It protects the right to mine Bitcoin, which is a, a big win for sound money in the Midwestern state. Now, think about this. The United States is not a democracy. <laughs> You've been lied to. Do you remember growing up as a kid, uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and to the republic for which it stands? The United States is a republic. What does that mean? That means we have a representative government. That means the United States was supposed to be, at the time, whatever, 13, uh, but now 50, 50 independent states. The states were meant to be independent. And so if you didn't like it in one state, you could move to another. The president is not really supposed to matter in our lives that much. The president most... If we were still in this constitutional republic that we're supposed to be in, most of us shouldn't even care about the president that much. The governor would be the one that we'd care about the most because we live in the states. And so what we're seeing is sort of a return to the state's rights, and we're starting to see this big difference between the states, really big difference in economics um, and even migration trends between red states and blue states. And we're seeing the blue states are massive in debt, like California went from a $100 billion surplus to a $25 billion deficit, massive deficits and massive uh, mass exodus and going to the red states. And so we're seeing, again, New York is attacking Bitcoin mining. Montana is passing bills to protect Bitcoin mining. Now, I'm not for, you know, attacking it, uh, but I am for seeing, you know, one attack it and one promote it because competition will play out and we'll see how that plays out. Uh, on top of that, we're seeing the war over central bank digital currencies. Of course, they're trying to rush those out as fast as they possibly can. I've been, I've been talking about, I did an interview with Whitney Webb on my main YouTube channel. Definitely, you should check that out. Search Mark Moss, Whitney Webb. You should definitely watch that video if you haven't. But we talked about how everything that's happening from the war in uh, Russia, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, I mean, all this stuff, the debt ceiling, it's all a distraction. The ultimate goal is to get all of us into this digital panopticon where we use a, uh, a, a digital passport that controls our movement, um, our digital money that controls our payments, and that's the goal. And what we're seeing is, you know, while it looks like Putin's fighting the globalists, they're both trying to push in central bank digital currencies. This is coming. The Fed now system is sort of like a CBDC. Of course, we're seeing it going in in Brazil. Brazil central bank invited firms to register their CBDC pilot program. The Bank of Canada becomes the latest central bank to advocate its uh, advance its CBDC agenda. And we're seeing that. But in the United States, we see Ron DeSantis stepping up and banning it. He says, quote, if you don't trust central authority, then you should see this immediately as something that is very problematic talking about central bank digital currencies, North Carolina passed a bill prohibiting state payments with CBDC, central bank digital currency. I recently interviewed uh, presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy, and he's running on this platform. We see uh, Democratic uh, candidate um, Kennedy Jr. is running on a, on a platform. This is coming to a head. It's the battle to be watching out for. Big, big stuff was happening this week in the economy, of course, because we're at, you know, we're at this end. I, I talk about three revolutionary cycles, a political revolution cycle, 250-year political revolution cycle, an 80-year financial revolution cycle, and a 50-year technological revolution cycle. And here we are at the end of this 80-year financial revolution cycle. So, of course, the economy is going crazy. We're witnessing sovereign debt crises. The United States government, the European Union, the Bank of Japan, they're all going bankrupt. 
And so as they're going bankrupt, they're printing more money. It's pushing inflation sky high. And of course, we're seeing that in the United States. The Fed has been on this war path to stop inflation by raising rates at the fastest rate in history. We talk about this all the time. And good news, good news. It looks like they're winning. It looks like the data is showing that CPI, the Consumer Price Index, it looks like it's coming down. Congratulations. We're all the way down. I believe last September we were a high of 9.1. And the latest data that came out this week shows we're down to 4.9%. I think that's 10 months now of consecutive year-over-year -year decline. Woo! Congratulations. Uh, good job to the Federal Reserve. I have uh, – let me see. Let's do this. There we go. Uh, good job. Good job, Federal Reserve. Congratulations. Now, if you watch my main YouTube channel, you know uh, I did well, I did a video, I think, in January, and I talked about how they were going to change the way they calculated CPI. And I said, just changing the way they were gonna, going to calculate CPI, if nothing else changed, but just change the way we calculate it, we're going to see CPI dropping drastically. And I said, by the end of the summer, it could be down by 3%. So here we are, surprise, surprise, and we're down to 4.9. We're trending down, and I think that new calculation is helping quite a bit. What is that new calculation? Well, basically, what they were doing is instead they would typically take a two-year comp, a two-year comparison, and they change it to a one-year comparison. Now, why does that matter? Well, because if you look back to last year at the highest point in 50 years and you measure from there, well, then it looks like we dropped a lot because you're measuring from the very peak that we've ever been on a two year drop. On a, I'm sorry, on a two year average, you wouldn't have seen that as much. So we have come down. How, how, however, however, let me, let me put this into perspective. The CPI is a basket. It tracks the basket of goods through time. So it tracks your quality of life. So back in 1980, they went to the grocery store and they had a basket of goods, steak, milk, cheese, etc. And then they're supposed to track that basket throughout time to see how the prices change. However, they constantly change the basket. They constantly change the way they calculate it. So Shadow Stats is a, is a website, a company that tracks the original basket of goods through time. And according to Shadow Stats, uh, real world inflation is down to 12.9%, down from a peak of 17.3% in June of last year. So not the 4.9% they're telling us, the 12.9% is the real number. But actually, while that's the real number, going back to the original calculation, to the original basket of goods, it's not the same for everybody. Measuring inflation that way is sort of ridiculous because inflation affects us all differently. If you're living in your parents' basement watching Netflix and eating Taco Bell, inflation hasn't barely touched you at all. If you're buying lakefront property in Austin, Texas, sending, your, sending two or three of your kids to college or putting them through weddings, inflation has ravaged you, right? Homes on, homes on the lake in Texas have gone up 150%. So if you're buying that home, then inflation is massive for you. And again, if you're living in your parents' basement, it hasn't even affected you. So inflation is different for all of us, depends on what you buy. I eat steak all the time. So inflation has affected me more. What the CPI basket does is say, well, people aren't going to buy steak now. Now they'll buy hamburger meat. And now they won't buy hamburger meat anymore. Now they'll eat tofu. Well, I'm not. I'm going to continue eating steak, so it's affected me more. And it affects all of us differently based off of the things that we're buying and based off the proportions and things like that. So just know that the even the shadow stats number, while it's accurate and true to the way it used to be calculated, it's not accurate and true for every one of us. In addition to that, uh, while there seems to be taking... Uh, while it seems that the Fed's attack on inflation is somewhat working, bringing it down from 9.1 to 4.9, it's not without damage to the economy. As a matter of fact, you know, that's their whole goal is to make everybody broke because if they make you broke, you don't have enough money to buy things. If you don't have enough money to buy things, then they hope prices come down. However, it's effect when, when they make everybody broke, you also don't have money to buy goods and services from businesses. And so it's been very, very bad for the economy. As a matter of fact, the small business index, the optimism index, just hit a 10-year low. It fell by 1.1 uh, points in April to 89, hitting the lowest level in just over 10 years. As business owners reported dampened expectations for the broad economy, sales, and earnings. The biggest source of concern was the labor market, with 45% of owners reporting job openings they couldn't fill last month, compared to 43% um, in March. 
And inflation was a close second as 33% of owners said they raised average selling prices. So that's the big concern. Uh, the labor market, they can't, um, they can't fill the job openings and then they're having to raise their prices. And I've been seeing in a lot of cases, they're saying that, look, we've been raising our prices, raising our prices, raising our prices, because obviously we can't sell our stuff at a loss, but people don't want to pay it. And so what does that do? It slows down the economy. Of course, it's not rocket science, right? In addition, it's taking a toll. Um, it, it takes a toll all across the ecosystem. And so, for example, those businesses now can't afford their rent. We're seeing in New York City, there's so many office buildings empty. It's about 50% of where it was pre-pandemic. They said that you could get 26 Empire State buildings into New York's empty office building space. 50% occupancy. Now, if you're a building owner or you're a pension fund or your, your retirement account is invested into a group that has invested into these, these REITs and these funds, you're taking a big, big loss. San Fran, downtown San Francisco is not much different. There's 18.4 million square feet of empty office space. Now, part of it is because business has been hammered. Part of it's also because nobody, <laughs> they don't want to stay in San Francisco anymore. Everybody's bailed out of their and on top of it, we have the banks continuing to get hammered as everybody's been pulling their money out of the banks to put them into money market funds and treasuries. Why are you making 0% in the bank and Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Citibank, et cetera, when you can go make 5% in a treasury, in a money market fund? And of course, you shouldn't. Hopefully, you're not doing that. And so you don't have to. And so uh, massive amounts of money have been moving over there. The economy is moving fast. And one of the big changes that we're seeing really kind of goes into uh, a big, 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 big theme, which is, of course, uh, at the very top kind of goes into one word, which is censorship. And the censorship is important because, as I kind of outlined earlier, if you're just tuning in, you missed it, but um, how the powers that be are always going to try to control and stifle innovation because they need to con they want to maintain the status quo. And if you can do whatever you want, they can't control you. They can't control the status quo. And so they'll censor you through many ways, censor your movement, censor your conversation, censor your thoughts, censor your transactions, et cetera. That's right. Censorship, control, same thing. And we're seeing it uh, really coming to head in the communication side, what we're seeing on mainstream media, what's happening on the internet, you know, conversations with, um, you know, bigger people than me, like, you know, Joe Rogan and Tucker Carlson, uh, but, you know, outlets, uh, alternative outlets that they can't control. And what's interesting I saw this week is it seems like we're starting to see this big shift where we have, you know, the powers that be, um, the Biden, Obama, Biden administration, as I like to call it, um, that are the incumbents that are trying to maintain this power. But all of a sudden, it's starting to look like mainstream media might be turning their back on good old Biden. Now, I don't know if that is uh, part of my, you know, uh, conspiracy hat is like uh, maybe the powers that be to control that party. Obama wants to get Biden out now that he's committed to another uh, term. Oh, oh, no, 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 you're not. Let's get you out. Or is it that we're really seeing a shift in just uh, truth and reporting? I don't know. I'll leave you up. I'll leave you uh, up to decide. But of course, I'd love to hear from you. Reach out. Hit me up on social media at one Mark Moss. Let me know what you think about that. Is it that uh, they're starting to throw him under the bus to get him out, or is it that this is just a bigger shift that's happening in the media? But what we saw this week was a ton of stories coming out. Um, Oversight committee. Biden family business received over ten million from Romania, China, for unknown work. It says, in total, Biden family members and business associates designed a web of over 20 different companies, many of which, which were formed during Joe Biden's vice presidency. The committee revealed, the funds appear to contradict Joe's claims that his family received no money from China. Now, this shouldn't be a big surprise to some people if you've been paying attention because we've seen this. I mean, Tucker Carlson had on somebody who worked for the Biden family and blew the whistle on all this. And he had the names, the dates, the receipts, you know, where the bodies were buried, so to speak. Uh, so, you know, I think it's been blown wide open. We've seen what's going on with Hunter Biden, Burisma in, in, in Ukraine. And like I said, You've seen the 10% uh, 10 for, 10 for the big guy, so to speak, right? So we've, we've known this, but now it's really starting to see the light of day. 
Uh, Jim Jordan, he's uh, one of the few people in, in uh, government that I still somewhat respect. Uh, Jim Jordan reveals that there's 170 suspicious activity reports, those are what's called SARS reports, um, surrounding the Biden family. 170. Now, you know, there's that saying, where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah, something like that. That's a lot of smoke. They had, a, they had a full press conference where they had a whole bunch of members of, of, uh, of the government you know, up there, uh, up on stage. I don't know why they need so many people on stage when they do the appointments anymore. But um, he, basically, he, he basically said how there was this 170 uh, suspicious reports there. Um, everybody in the family is getting in a piece of action. And he posed a fundamental question that's yet to be answered. And that is, what did they do to warrant the receipt of millions and millions of dollars? It's a good question. It's a good question that we've been asking from the beginning. When President Biden was still Vice President Biden, he flew on Air Force Two on official business over to China, and he took his son, Hunter, on the plane with him on official business to China. And upon their return, Hunter Biden had received money from, I believe, the PBOC, someone directly in China, for a fund that he was running. And I believe it was the first time that an American fund had received money directly from China. And what did that fund buy? Oh, that would be American uh, military stuff. So what did he receive that money for? That's always the question, right? And if you watch any murder mystery or, you know, TV show, whatever, detective show, it's always follow the money, right? So back to Jim Jordan's question, what did they do to warrant the receipt of millions of dollars? Uh, we saw a Biden rape accuser, Tara Reid, came out and said, if something happens to me, it all roads lead back to Joe Biden. She said, quote, I want to make sure something clear. If something happens to me, all, reads low, uh, re all roads lead back to Joe Biden. Uh, she said that she's been being bullied and intimidated for the last three years. And she said, <laughs> said I'm not suicidal. Um, we saw Biden's job approval rating hit a brand new low. The Democratic strategist advises the White House to wake up before it's too late. It's dipped to a new low of 36% uh, uh, less than two weeks after he formally announced his intention to seek re-election. Biden sees a 30-point drop in approval from black Americans in the latest poll. Um, uh, an ex-prosecutor came out and said that he blew the whistle, and he claimed Joe Biden involved was involved in bribery. He had the whistle for that. The whistleblower alleges the FBI and the DOJ have documents revealing criminal schemes involving the Biden foreign national um, campaign. It says that the FBI and DOJ are in possession of a document that describes a criminal scheme involving then VP Joe Biden and a foreign national related to the exchange of money for policy decisions. I mean, we can go on. I, I mean, there are so many stories here. Whistleblower claims against Biden could be the biggest U.S. scandal ever. We can go on and on and on. These allegations are more serious than anything involved in the Watergate scandal that brought down Richard Nixon. Uh, this is the biggest thing. This, this is the big thing. We can keep going on and on and on. But the point is, is like, what's going on? Why are all these stories coming out? I would like to say that it's because there's a changing of the guard. I would like to say that because the rise of of all these alternative news sources and media sources are starting to drag the rest of uh, media reporting along. Everybody, you know, CNN's ratings are down in the gutter because everybody knows it's just propaganda all the time. And so as the rise of these alternative news sources are, are coming up and people are now starting to go over there to get the truth, the other mainstream news sources are going to have to start to come along or they're going to lose out completely. So I'd like to think it's that. Uh, like I said, it could be just that they want to throw them under the bus. We do see that, of course, they're not going to go out quietly. The White House is now going to limit press credentials to those who act, quote unquote, professional. On Friday, the White House press announced tighter press badge restrictions, including required journalists who currently have badges to reapply. The new rules would also empower the administration to boot reporters who refuse to, quote, act in a professional manner. Now, what is that? What's a professional manner? Does that mean that they only ask questions that they want to be asked? Now, I mean, obviously, no one's going to uh, want people there that are disrupting the peace, you know, jumping up and down, assaulting other people, things like that. But they should be there asking the hard questions. 
We don't know what act in a professional manner is, but anytime they start to pass new uh, bills and acts to uh, censor people, you have to start to question that. <clears throat> we saw the White House bans the New York Post from a Biden event. Not content with limiting Biden to a modern record low of full press conferences, the White House staff on Monday banned the Post Steve Nelson from the president's only daytime public event leaving around 20 of the venue's 50 or so seats empty. So about half of the venue was empty, and they wouldn't let the New York Post in. Now, I believe the New York Post is one of the oldest publications in the United States, something like that. I didn't look that up, so fact check me, but something like that. One of the oldest publications in the United States. It, it, it's a big news source. You may not like it, but that doesn't change the fact that it's been around a long time and it's big. And so to ban them uh, in, in, a, in a free country where we're supposed to have freedom of information and uh, freedom of the press, it's a pretty big deal. Look, human beings are able to speak. Animals can't speak. One of the big differentiators between us and animals, we can speak. We should be able to do that. We should be able to speak freely. But of course, as I constantly talk about the powers of be, don't want that to happen because they want to maintain the narrative, to maintain the power, to maintain the control. I've been talking about this quite a bit. Uh, last week, we kind of went pretty deep on this. If you, if you missed that, check it out on the podcast. Just search The Mark Moss Show on the podcast. You can go to, my, uh, go to the Market Disruptors YouTube channel. You could watch me and listen to me at the same time. But we talked about how the world was on the cusp, the cusp of woke totalitarianism as governments around the world are acting to end free speech. Went pretty deep into that. I'm not going to go through that again. If you want to get more into that, which you should, it's probably the single most important discussion, the single most important fight of our lifetime is happening right now. So you should certainly go check that out. But uh, we're seeing a media blackout as politicians in the EU, the US, the UK, Brazil, Ireland, Canada, Australia, they're all putting in policies that would literally seek to gel citizens for what they consider wrong thing under the cover of what they're saying is, of course, for your protection. Of course, it's always for your protection. Uh, they have to protect you from hate speech. Now, what is hate speech? Well, I don't know. I would imagine if you asked a bunch of people, you're going to get a bunch of different answers because there's no definition for what hate speech is. Hate speech is whatever they say it is. And so we've been seeing this for a long time. Um, and um, we're seeing... A lot of turmoil in the mainstream media. The mainstream media they've used, you know, the CNNs, the MSNBCs, to control the narrative has have been losing market share because people realize that they're being lied to. We saw Vice Media is one of those outlets that's been is now find itself in bankruptcy, and it looks like they're getting bailed out by the the uh, biggest defender of freedom of speech. No, I'm just joking. I actually mean the opposite. Uh, probably the biggest uh, opponent of free speech, I'm talking about good old George Soros. So George Soros, uh, of course, who spends all his money, his billions and billions of dollars to try to suppress freedom of movement and freedom of speech, is now trying to buy Vice Media for $400 million, buying them out of bankruptcy, which, of course, is just a drop in the bucket for him. He doesn't care, right? He throws around this money like nothing, um, but it, it looks like you know he wants to reorganize this. He wants to wipe out all the other investors, take it over because they have to maintain the narrative. Now, another outlet that's now all of a sudden finding itself losing massive followers is, of course, Fox News. Fox News abruptly dropped Tucker Carlson out of the media. Now, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not a huge Tucker Carlson fan. I like him. I watch him sometimes. Um, you know, if he suggested on my YouTube feed and it seems like an interesting topic, I'll watch it. I think he's entertaining. I, you may hate me for this, but I generally think he's a pretty, you know, I, 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 somewhat neutral. I see him attacking mostly Democrats, but I see him attack Republicans pretty equally. Uh, there was this big, uh, you know, uproar not too long ago because he had come out pretty strongly saying he didn't like Donald Trump. He might have even used uh, harder language than that. So, you know, he said he doesn't like Donald Trump. He's been, you know, pretty hard on, on Republicans. He's against Democrats. I think, to me, Dr. Tucker Carlson seems like he's more for common sense. I know um, CNN ran a piece I saw this week calling him extreme right wing. 
Um, okay, I guess if common sense and freedom, um, if questioning the narrative makes you extreme right wing, I don't know. If you have some feedback on that, uh, I'd love to hear it. I've seen people, you know, posting online that, you know, he's, he's the perpetrator of hate speech. I'd like examples of that. But anyway, love him or hate him, uh, he's the number one draw on TV. And of course, he's been taking it hard. People have asked me in some other interviews why I think Tucker Carlson was dropped. I would say either one, because he went against Big Pharma. Uh, Pfizer is like a sponsor of all these shows now. And he was uh, talking about the data that's been coming out showing how they basically were pushing, pushing this, this medicine on people that had been untested and, and was harmful. So that, that certainly could have got him kicked off the air. There was this big dominion thing. He talked a lot about the election. I think another big thing that probably had a lot to do with it was um, releasing the January 6th videos. Cause again, going back to controlling the narrative, I think that was a really, really big piece. They were trying to control the narrative on, you know, the whole um, insurrection and the Donald Trump. And then, of course, using that to restrict even more free speech. And so uh, by showing those videos, he blew that wide open. Um, so it could have been any number of those. It could have been put, put could have been all of them collectively. Either case, uh, he got dropped. Now, reportedly, they want to pay him. Fox News wants to pay him 20 million dollars a year to do nothing until 2025. So effectively silence them. You see this a lot of times with big businesses that are trying to corner the market. They might buy a smaller brand and then just shelf it. And this is seemingly kind of what they want to do. They're just going to keep his contract in, in place, but not allow him to talk anymore. So pay $20 million a year to silence him. But in this world of decentralization, it's not really that possible anymore. And in, as a matter of fact, Tucker Carlson announced in a tweet that he is going to start putting content out on Twitter, which I thought was pretty interesting. The post that he put up talking about how mainstream media lies to us, it was, it was an interesting post. He talks about how mainstream media tells you the truth that any fact checker would tell you is the truth, but it's a lie because they've omitted lots of information. They've withheld information, so they control the narrative. So even what they told you would pass a fact checker's um, check, uh, it's, it's, it's actually dishonest because of the stuff they withhold. It was, it was a pretty good clip. And in that clip, he got over 100 million views. Pretty amazing. And he talks about coming back onto Twitter and using that platform. Now, I'm guessing somewhere in his contract, it says he couldn't do something like, um, you know, go onto another news network, whether that be online or TV, whatever. So there's probably a lot around that. But it probably didn't say he can't post on social media because probably don't think about doing that. And now we have Twitter that seemingly kind of standing up for some free speech. And so we'll see where that goes. But I think the most important piece in there is that Elon Musk is trying to turn Twitter into this like content creator platform. And really what we're seeing is the rise of this creator economy and sort of like this value for value model. And I've long been saying that Bitcoin really opens that up because they can't really stop the internet. You know, Alex Jones was wiped off the face of the earth, but yet he's bigger than he ever has been on his own website. And so they can't really stop you from creating content on the internet. I mean, if they shut down Twitter, just go like Alex Jones did on his own website and people would follow Tucker wherever he wanted. Tucker doesn't just have viewers, he has fans and the fans will follow him. Where they'll cut you off is they'll cut you off on the payments. So the sponsors won't sponsor you anymore. Your credit card companies will cut you off, et cetera. But on a value for value model, if you can post content directly and then get paid in Bitcoin, I mean, you're pretty much unstoppable. And so uh, it, it's, it's, he, he obviously hasn't come out and said that as much. Uh, we're going into the Bitcoin conference, the largest gathering of Bitcoiners in the world coming up next week in Miami. And I know Tucker Carlson was there last year. I know he's had Michael Saylor on to talk about Bitcoin. He's had President Bukele from El Salvador on to talk about Bitcoin. So he's very aware of it. They haven't come out and talked about that, but pay attention because this is happening. It's happening right here. The rise of this content creator um, economy, this value for value economy, and as people can start cutting out sponsors and cutting out the need to have this mainstream network, which seems so old and obsolete when you actually think about it, like we need a steady lineup of people to tell us what to do and it needs to be like linear. Like I can't just like watch on demand anymore. But as we see this rise, as we continue to see this value for value model uh, grow, uh, we're going to continue to see decentralization in media. And I think we'll continue to see more and more people turn to Bitcoin, which will give them the freedom of transactions. 
If you just tune in, you're listening to The Mark Moss Show. Of course, we're talking about the decentralized revolution each and every week. I was running through some of the latest breaking news headlines this week so you can see exactly what is going on. Because if you don't zoom out, it's hard to see. But when you look at it that way, you can understand what's going on. That's what I got for this segment. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time.